Thank you very much. Welcome, everyone. Sorry. <laughs> Welcome, everyone. Of course, I was muted, probably loud things. So I was saying uh, thanks for joining this webinar today. And uh, uh, thanks to the organizers, first of all, uh, the uh, ALBA office that could allow this webinar to happen. And also to this, today's speaker, Dr. David Pagliaccio, and uh, uh, my co-chair, who will moderate the discussion, Dr. Dori Dreisel. I'm uh, so happy that this webinar could happen today in this month, especially because, as um, most of you know, uh, I'm sure this is Pride Month, and this is the last day of Pride Month, which means that starting tomorrow, July 1st, we'll probably see these appearing, many of these flags on the street, uh, many of these uh, rainbow logos that many corporations, uh, including universities, public places, they're going to display. And I'm sure that uh, all of us are, are very familiar with this shift between what is the support for diversity in general and uh, what is then uh, the complete disregard for and for this uh, advocacy for uh, the rest of the year. And that is why an organization like Alba Network and our advocacy and your attendance today is so important for, for uh, to keep and moving forward our uh, activities. And what happens is that I think I also might have, uh, I, I also might have, uh, uh, a different, um, a different uh, approach uh, uh, or a different, sorry, I'm, I also might have uh, an intrinsic bias because I know that I am, I am more prone to uh, read and watch documentaries uh, during this month because also the accessibility and availability of all this activity happens more during this month. And this is not my fault. It's, you know, all of us here, I'm sure we are very good advocates and, and without platforms like Alba Network, this would be limited to this month. And it happened to me a uh, few um, days ago to um, see, to, to uh, I have watched two uh, documentaries basically, uh, which were extremely moving and they made me understand how our constant activity is uh, important because even if some of us feel that we are free to do some activities, we are now in a sort of freedom expression. This documentary made me understand that there is always a thin line where one event can happen and things can move drastically and change drastically. Not to mention what's happening now in the United States and all over the world in some countries with bills, signing, signing bills, uh, signed bills that are against uh, women and the rights of women, against the minor, other minoritized communities, against the LGBTQIA plus community. And that's we here for this and thanks to uh, ALBA to uh, continue the support uh, for the minoritized community in general. Today, we are focusing on the LGBTQIA um, rights and uh, what means to bring on this fight. <laughs> and uh, the two documentaries I mentioned are now in the chat. One, uh, one, is, called, uh, the, one is called, my name is uh, Polly Murray and uh, that I invite you to watch is probably on Amazon Prime and the other one is on Netflix, it's called El Dorado, All the Nazi, All the Nazi Hates Hated. Um, let me uh, give you a very brief introduction before starting on what uh, ALBA is and what ALBA has accomplished so far. So ALBA is a network that includes brain scientists, which is global, psychologists, psychiatrists, neuroscientists, and everyone, so, and everyone that studies the brain. Uh, today's seminar is introduced by me, by co-chaired, by my co-chair, 
uh, of the uh, of a group of a working group called Sexual and Gender Diversity Working Group. Um, this, what is the main goal of ALBA Network is, of course, as you see, diversity, equity, and inclusion. ALBA was launched in 2019, and it counted few members. Now it counts uh, 15, uh, over, almost over 1,400 members in 85 countries. It is empowering brain scientists for effective diversity, equity, and inclusion. It advocates for sharing data and best, and best practices to counter bias and discrimination, recognizing outstanding contributions to science and diversity and highlighting success stories and providing a better visibility and professional development opportunity to neuroscience from underrepresented and minoritized group. Some of the ALBA activities are included here and include awareness and advocacy, data resources, visibility and recognition, networking and mentoring. And since we are in awareness and advocacy, I'm, I'm talking about that, I would strongly encourage to register to become an ALBA member. Uh, becoming an ALBA member is totally free. And please go ahead and uh, um, become familiar with ALBA mission if you want and read the declaration. And if, and if you agree with the declaration, if you want to contribute to make the declaration better, feel free to uh, connect become a member, read and sign the declaration. Some of the supporting career development events that have been organized by Alba Network include, include mentoring circles, panels, lectures, and networking socials. You can see uh, now in the chat, a previous event last year that was organized by the Gender and Sexual Diversity Working Group. Uh, as this year, uh, we have a tradition of uh, valuing uh, mentoring for underrepresented minority uh, broad, broad, uh, broadly, um, underrepresented minority, but I would say minoritized community specials, especially. And so uh, feel free to join ALBA and also support us in one of these silos activities. To get involved, you can sign the declaration, you can host a DEI event, share useful resources, or engage with ALBA on social media. This is all free, as I mentioned, and uh, it's open to a diverse network of neuroscientists, psychologists, psychiatrists, and I'm sure that all of your feedback and input would be invaluable to the community. These are the ALBA network uh, sponsors, which you see it's increasing worldwide. And this is the gender and sexual diversity working group that we currently have. As I mentioned, I co-chair this group with Dori Greisel. I'm, I also serve in the board of directors of uh, Alba Network. And I think Dr. Greisler is doing an incredible job in advancing uh, some of the activities that the working group is moving forward with. And uh, this is why, without further ado, I, ado, so I think um, I would like to pass it on to Dori Greisel, who will modulate, moderate today's uh, exciting webinar. And I uh, thank you for joining, and I'll see you for uh, the goodbye at the end. Please feel free to ask questions in the chat, uh, but Dori will guide you on all this. Thank you very much. Thanks so much, Jordan, um, and welcome everyone. Uh, it's so nice to have so many people here. Um, so uh, just to just to touch on what is on the screen now, this is one of the activities that we've been doing with the um, Gender and Sexual Diversity Working Group. So we've um, created these guidelines for inclusive conferences, uh, or rather inclusive inclusive forums. So, for example, for conferences, but also for um, for other purposes, so please check them out and feel free to to give feedback on that as well. Um, then earlier, I copied the code of conduct in um, in the chat. This is just for for our webinar that we want everyone to be able to enjoy it, to be able to ask questions um, and engage in a in a positive way. 
Um, so then let me introduce David. Um, so I'm very glad that we have David here and that he agreed to, to give this talk. Um, so he is currently an assistant professor in child and adolescent psychiatry at New York State Psychi Psychi Psychiatric Institute and Columbia University. Um, he completed his PhD at the uh, at Washington U University in St. Louis and did a postdoctoral fellowship at the National Institute of Mental Health. And his research focuses on using MRI to understand brain mechanisms in depression and anxiety in youth. Um, but today we'll be talking about his uh, some of his other work, which is this incredible um, paper where he looked at the experience of LGBTQIA plus people in brain sciences, um, which obviously is very relevant to um, to this month, Pride Month. Um, so we're very happy to have him. Um, and please join me in welcoming David. Cool. Well, thanks again to, to Jordan and Dory and to, to Alba for inviting me to do this webinar for, for Pride. I'm really excited to be here and for everyone who's listening in and also to be a new member of the working group. Um, so I'm going to try to go through kind of some big picture and a little bit of the data that I've collected uh, about queer scientists in, in brain sciences specifically. I'll try to keep this through about a half hour so we can have some discussion at the end as well. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions kind of later on. Um, and usually when I talk about this, I like to start at a very kind of bird's eye view of our situation and really just remind people that we are still living in a world where there are a number of countries that criminalize homosexuality, even to the point of corporal punishment today. Um, and really kind of zooming in there from there onto our small microcosm of academia. Um, so I personally work in the US. Um, so we're not currently under threat of jail. We've seen a huge rash of anti-LGBTQ bills in the US, a ton of legal backsliding um, and protections for, for queer people in the US. Uh, so the left is just a map of new anti-LGBTQ bills that were introduced in 2022 alone from the HRC. Um, and the right is sort of an ever updating map from Aaron Reed, who's a trans activist who's done a lot of work in this space, just showing new anti-trans specific bills to really mostly limitations on gender affirming care um, across most of the US. Um, and these legal trends to me really fly in the face of changes in um, identity, at least in the US. So this is some survey data from, from Gallup a couple of years ago looking at trends in LGBTQ identity across generations. And we really see that more and more people are identifying as part of the LGBTQ community. Um, it's really critical to understand these changing trends, both as a scientist, so working with um, human subjects populations myself, you know, we really need to understand these sociodemographic trends, uh, but also figuring out ways to better support our colleagues. Um, and so when you break this data down, kind of looking at Gen Z, we're over 20% of people identify as something other than heterosexual. Uh, we see this really huge uptick in people identifying as bi or pansexual. Um, so personally, I think this is really kind of about changes in identity and acceptance of identity rather than changes in sexuality um, itself. Um, and it's really heartening to see kind of more and more people uh, accepting their identity, coming to terms with their identity, and, and being out about their identity today. Um, that said, um, especially for us kind of in psychological sciences, there is really huge major uh, mental health outcomes disparities for queer people. Uh, so this was a study from a couple years ago looking at suicide attempts among high school students in the US. And we can see first, really troublingly high rates of suicide attempts among high school students in general. Uh, but this is vastly disproportionate among high school students identifying as sexual minorities. Um, this is a huge crisis in the US that kind of we're hoping to address. Uh, some small heartening news, again, this was a few years ago, but after same-sex marriage policies were enacted in the US, 
there is this meaningful downtick in suicide attempts among sexual minority high school students. So even kind of broad policies that are not necessarily affecting these students directly, kind of changing the milieu in which they're growing up kind of can help ameliorate these mental health crises. And we know that policies have a, kind of a trickle down impact. Uh, so turning more to the academic space, often what we're talking about is this leaky pipeline in, in STEM and sciences particularly. Uh, so this is the graphic that was actually put together from an article about um, experiences of women in STEM. So really breaking down a number of different uh, change points and the uh, STEM trajectory and places where women get essentially pushed out of the field due to a number of factors, starting with very early stereotypes and biases about kind of the interests of girls in early education, that you know, STEM is more an interest for boys to lack of role models and support at, at every cre uh, career point along the pipeline. Um, and so there's a lot of discussion about this for women and also for people of color, that these same things apply kind of across the STEM trajectory. I think implicitly we know that many of these same barriers exist for queer people, uh, but it's simply not studied as much. Um, so when we look at kind of these models, these are really the same types of things that we're talking about for queer people in STEM. So stereotypes, implicit bias, discrimination, active harassment, um, and particularly lack of role models and visibility of other queer scientists. Um, and this really all affects retention in STEM at all levels. Um, and I think we might talk about this a little bit later, but there's also really a lack of lack of data and a lack of consideration of queer identity in kind of STEM and also DEI efforts. Um, so there is a little bit of data and I just wanted to share kind of some of the background. Um, so just kind of a broad array of things that I found in the literature. So on the left is actually kind of more business data. So uh, work from McKinsey looking at the representation of queer women in corporate management in the US. And you can see this very clear trend where across um, hierarchical levels in, in corporations, you see this sharp decrease in representation of queer, queer women. Um, in more the academic STEM setting, there's uh, a handful of literature out there. So this um, study from Eric Cottridge several years ago, looking at a queer identified faculty um, a huge percentage of them are actively considering leaving their institution at any given time per the survey. And really the, the climate and their comfort on campus is driving this. So uh, a majority of people that don't feel comfortable on their campus are thinking about leaving at any given time. So really getting into this kind of attrition across the leaky pipeline. Um, and also this interesting study at looking at specifically male university students who declare a STEM major when they come into university and then tracking where they end up when they graduate. Um, and though the vast majority of people stay in STEM fields, you can really see this sharp disparity where sexual minority um, university students tend to leave STEM majors for other majors and kind of implicitly being pushed out of these fields through their four years of university in the US. Um, and again, there are a number of reasons for this. I think today, at least in the US, most of this is due to some form of implicit discrimination. Uh, we often talk about uh, death by a thousand cuts, so all these little things that add up to your kind of day-to-day -day microaggressions that push you out of these often unsafe spaces. Uh, so this graphic is from an HRC report several years ago, um, particularly looking at, I think, corporate workspaces, so not necessarily academia, but a lot of this applies the same way. So looking at people's experiences in the workplace, um, a, a lot of people report hearing kind of jokes, inappropriate comments about queer people in the day-to-day -day workplace. Um, and really troublingly, at least half of people said that if they heard something like this, they would either ignore it or let it go simply because they thought people wouldn't do anything about it or wouldn't want to listen. 
Um, I often think about this sort of as a, so what did you do this weekend problem? Uh, so just kind of in building interpersonal relationships in academia, um, as a queer trainee or faculty, you may be asked, kind of, what did you do this weekend as a standard question? Um, and there's this added burden thinking about when and to who you want to disclose your, your personal life to that cisgender straight people don't have to deal with. Uh, so in that same HRC report, 80% of straight people surveyed said that LGBT people shouldn't have to hide who they are at work. Um, but in the same breath, uh, less than half felt comfortable hearing LGBT coworkers talk about their personal lives. Um, with the majority saying that talking about your sexual orientation or gender identity in the workplace is unprofessional. And so if I am talking to a colleague at work about something that my boyfriend and I did over the weekend, that may be deemed unprofessional, where a straight colleague talking about their partner, the same thing is considered sort of normalized and, and typical professional workplace commentary. Um, and in this space, we're often further told that our queer identity is not relevant to our experience as a scientist. So really kind of put into this bind where people think we should be able to talk about it, but then when it comes to actually talking about it, people don't want to hear it. Um, and John Freeman wrote this very poignant piece, who's also a member of the working group, talking about his experiences and how queer scientists are still left out of, kind of mainstream DEI initiatives. Uh, and he recounts the story when he was on the job market for a faculty position in the brain sciences, that during I think, a final round interview with 13 different faculty, um, all of these people asked him about his wife. And as a queer person, you're faced with this real conflict in a professional uh, job interview that asking about this is not necessarily appropriate or allowed. Um, but do you kind of make a stand and say, this is not appropriate or I'm actually queer? Um, or do you let this slide in order to kind of build the necessary relationships to get this job? Um, and so I'm just going to transition to some of the data that I've been collecting. Um, and the goal of this work for me is really that um, we don't have as much data about queer people's experiences in academia specifically. Um, and given these changes and trends over time, we really need to continuously update these, these data to understand hopefully that things are getting better or continued ways that we can improve uh, climate in this area. Um, also, when you look at the literature on kind of academic experiences, uh, the vast majority really focuses on the undergraduate college experience. And, you know, as for the all the audience, there's really, really very little on kind of brain science fields. I think the people that have generally been conducting this work tend to be, be more in the chemistry or other biological sciences. And kind of our membership is often not surveyed in these fields. Um, and personally, I feel like our kind of brain science fields are a really interesting microcosm. So we encompass both basic scientists and clinicians. A lot of us are studying human behavior and sexuality. Uh, we often have more frequent interactions with human participants or um, patients. And also a lot of us are working specifically with queer populations. And so a lot of these factors are kind of different than other people's experiences in STEM, there's maybe added stressors about being out to your patients in a clinical population that haven't really been surveyed in a lot of existing work. Um, so this was a really brief survey study distributed online uh, kind of during COVID. Um, so trying to reach people via social media, listservs, professional organizations. I, I was very grateful to kind of be flooded with responses from people and assembled a data set of over 500 individuals who all work or study at an academic institution or all in kind of brain sciences or related fields and all identify as, as queer. Um, and I'm just gonna kind of go through some of the highlights of, of this work. Um, so just to kind of give you a sense of, of this data set, um, I was really happy to get a range of 
of trainees, so undergraduates, graduate students, postdocs, um, as well as faculty in the field. So not really focusing on any one narrow sort of subpopulation, but getting a broader spectrum of people across career stages. Um, similar to kind of the larger population trends, we do see that uh, younger trainees tend to be uh, tend to more often identify as non-binary, gender non-conforming, bisexual or pansexual than older kind of faculty. Um, for the, all the audience, I would note that this is uh, largely uh, overrepresenting the US, and that's something I'm hoping to address in the future, kind of getting a broader international spectrum here. Um, and interestingly, the majority of people that responded to this do work with human populations rather than more basic science. Um, and I'm happy to go through any of these details if people are interested later. Uh, so really the first thing that I was interested in is simply are people out about their identity in the workplace? And only about half of respondents, you know, this is last year, said that they were out about their identity to most or all people in the workplace. Sort of unsurprisingly, people are more likely to be out to students and mentees or maybe the younger people in their workplace and less people are out to their mentors or advisors in the workplace. Um, and really kind of uh, glaringly to me that uh, the vast majority of people surveyed were out in their personal lives. So 80% of people are out to kind of their friends. And I'm showing here the relationship between professional outness and personal outness. And though these two things are highly correlated, um, there's a large kind of disproportionate population of people that are out personally and not out professionally. So things in the workplace that are kind of stopping them from being more out about their identities. Uh, so when looking at some of these factors, this is kind of a regression table um, presenting a number of the predictors of who's out at work. Uh, just to summarize, and I'm again happy to go into more details later. Um, older age, people identifying as white, people working in research, uh, and interesting people working in sort of female majority spaces tend to be more likely to be out in the workplace. Uh, somewhat unsurprisingly, people are less out about their trans, bi, or asexual identity in the workplace. Um, and people also tend to be less out if they're working face-to-face -face with human participants or, or patients. So really identifying some places that we can sort of do better as an academic society to help people be comfortable and out. Um, one of the main things I was interested in is whether workplace climate is related to kind of people's outness and comfort in the workplace. Um, so asking a number of questions about workplace climate uh, we see that a positive climate really predicts likelihood of being out at work, really particularly driven by one's comfort in the workplace, sort of these top questions here. Um, and then really just having a friend or colleague at work that you can be open and rely on goes a long way in people's positive experiences in academic workplace and being out. Um, and this is not all that like, workplace climate is a pre-existing thing that leads you to be out. This is clearly going to be a bi-directional association so that people who are out may be able to find a more comfortable and positive niche in their workplace or, or find a supportive friend or colleague. So this does kind of go back and forth. Um, I was also really interested just in people's kind of free response experiences with working in academia. Um, so on a free text response about what stops you from being more out to people at work? I got a number of different responses. I'm trying to summarize kind of the common themes here. Uh, the plurality of responses are really about negative workplace climate and fear. Um, so worrying about stigma, worries about people's attitudes in the workplace, knowing that people tend to have negative attitudes towards trans people. Um, also concerns kind of about being uh, rejected by their, their family. So not being able to come out in the workplace because of sort of personal environment. Um, and also an interesting number of 
people reporting that people just assumed they were straight or cisgender. And so it never really came up. And so it's either awkward or an added burden on the individual to kind of out themselves and explain their identity to other people. And this was particularly salient among, for example, female identified people who are bisexual, but currently have a male partner and may present as being in a straight relationship um, or asexual people that didn't feel the need to burden themselves to come out to people in their workplace or educate people about their identity. Um, one of the more troubling things that came up was that a quarter of participants reported either observing or personally experiencing exclusionary behavior in the workplace. Um, so I kind of encapsulated this a little more broadly, so including bullying, harassment, feeling ignored or shunned by others in the workplace. Uh, over 25% of people reported um, observing and or personally experiencing. Unfortunately, again, this is really disproportionately represented among trans and non-binary people. Um, so about 20% of cisgendered people reported these types of exclusionary behaviors, but closer to 40% um, for the non-binary respondents. Um, sort of unsurprisingly, people in a, reporting a less positive workplace climate, more likely to report exclusionary behavior. Um, but also people that are more likely to be out at work. So though being out at work, you may be able to find a more positive climate, it may also open you up to harassment and exclusionary behavior. Um, so I was also hoping to know what people's institutions are doing to support queer people, really as an entree to figuring out how we can do better and what we need to really push for as a society. Um, so I presented people with five kind of very broad and sort of standard things that institutions may provide. Um, and then just asked, does your institution have this, yes or no, or do you not know and haven't been informed about this? Uh, so for example, asking like, do your institutional health benefits cover trans and uh, gender affirming care? And again, this is very US centric in terms of insurance. Um, and Overwhelmingly, people in this yellow bar just don't know what their benefits cover. Uh, unsurprisingly, trans individuals were much more aware of these institutional efforts. Um, but there's a lot that we can do just in kind of kind of making these uh, coverages available and making people aware of them if they exist. Um, a number of people found that you know, about 20 to 30 percent found that ongoing uh, diversity efforts at their institution just don't cover LGBTQ topics. Um, and uh, though about like 60 percent of people reported that their institution had either an official or an unofficial sort of affinity group, a, a lot of people, maybe a third, didn't know if this existed. And there's a lot of room for improvement, kind of just making these queer spaces available to people in the workplace. Um, and the vast majority of people just didn't know about support and at least one of these, these kind of basic measures. Um, and as a follow up, I was curious about people's sort of feelings about kind of the local policies and, and politics. So would um, Enforcement of non-discrimination policies at your institution depend on your personal supervisor's feelings towards queer people. This is really the kind of academic space that we work in that things are very driven by like one-to-one -one relationships with your mentor or your uh, department head, for example. And over 40% of people felt like uh, institutional discrimination policies would depend on kind of their individual supervisors' feelings towards queer people and ability to support them in that. Um, and similarly, about 20% of people said no, and about 20% of people were unsure whether they could report harassment or misconduct against queer people without fear of retaliation in their workplace. Um, 
And this, again, is very troubling and like a real space where we can kind of do better um, as a field. Um, and so personally, I studied mental health. So this was also a big question for me. Um, so looking at depression rates in this sample, um, I'm showing responses on the PHQ-8. So sort of an epidemiological measure of uh, depression symptoms. A vast majority of people, uh, presented of people in the sample report, at least moderate to severe depression symptoms, around 37%. This is like way beyond population uh, rates of sort of the general population. Um, so these red points are people kind of above a cutoff for moderate symptoms. The triangles here are people that may meet kind of uh, criteria for likely meeting um, major depressive disorder criteria. And we can see this very clear association where people in more positive climate report lower levels of depression. Um, we also see that people that are out professionally tend to report lower depression. Um, more negative experiences and harassment tends to relate to more depression. Um, and particularly a lack of inclusive climate and sort of personal negative experiences drive these associations with, with depression. So this is having like real consequences on people's lives outside of work. Um, and I try not to end too doom and gloom, but um, one of the things I always try to include is just what can people at institutions do to better support queer people um, locally? And so I think really looking to individuals to provide uh, guidance on what they want. And again, happy to go through this more later, but just to give you a sense, there was a wide range of responses. A lot of this was around just like simply facilitating social connection at the institution. So creating a queer dedicated space for people to connect, having social events where you can meet other queer people goes such a long way to combating isolation. Um, a major theme was really making sure that we're making meaningful change. So not the institution really kind of checking the box for diversity, um, but putting their money where their mouth is and, and really pushing for systemic changes um, and really kind of filling in the gaps, particularly for trans inclusion, for understanding of asexuality um, and a more like intersectional approach to, to understanding queer identity. Uh, I tried to kind of distill some of these into some key points for institutional change. This is really just kind of my distillation of, of people's suggestions and other things in the field. Um, just briefly, again, really kind of, if you have supportive policies already, make sure that those are accessible and people know about them and are using them. Uh, creating these kind of queer social spaces in the workplace is incredibly meaningful and really a little goes a long way in, in fostering connection and making people aware of other queer people in their workplace. Uh, providing all gender restrooms, including queer topics in ongoing DEI efforts. There were a lot of suggestions kind of about enhancing official curricula and trainings to include queer topics. This is something that came up even at Columbia as well, that um, there's just a lot of like, heteronormative and gender essentialist content, even in psychiatric training that hasn't been updated lately and a real lack of clinical training on working with queer populations. Um, and then again, sort of putting the money behind institutional policies and, and making a real effort to kind of hire, promote and retain minoritized individuals. Um, and that said, there are a lot of other organizations out there supporting queer people in science. So ALBA, again, thank you all for being here. Um, another a, a number of other uh, efforts that I'm showing here of creating identity and, and connection among queer people. A number of conferences are working to kind of create these affinity groups in, in smaller networks. Um, and I'll just also plug, I personally had felt like a lot of uh, lack of support and communication in sort of the brain sciences for queer people. And so I had initiated a 
Slack channel and a Twitter and a website called Queer Sip Neuro if people are interested. Um, yeah, and again, I'm happy to take any questions. There's a link and a QR code to the preprint of this paper um, and also to our Queer Sip Neuro community if people would like to join. Uh, yeah, and I'm happy to take questions if people have them. I can't see the chat, so. Thanks so much, David. Um, Thank you. I think we had a couple of questions already coming in. So um, Carlos Alberto Ramirez Villegas, who said, greetings from a research group, psychological development in context at the University de Valle Cali, um, and pointed out um, that they are working with people of non-binary gender um, and having difficult, and the difficulties that, that professors and students um, have. Um, and they would like to know if there uh, are any statistics of the decrease in percentage of shootings after the um, uh, LGBT uh, QIA plus marriage policies. Do you do you have any statistics on this, or do you know? I don't have that on hand. Um, I'm not aware of any decreases, unfortunately, but. There's definitely obviously been an uptick recently as well. So I don't know that it's super tied to kind of marriage and quality, but um, I'm assuming that data is out there and I'm just not aware off the top of my head. So. That's fair. <laughs> um, and then the second co question is from Aitan uh, Schrechtman Dreimann. Uh, they say, great talk, thanks. Do you find differences in your results between red or generally non-LGBTQ friendly states um, and the blue states in the US? Yeah, this is an unfortunately tricky question and sort of a, a systemic issue that I found that um, our IRB that reviewed the study protocol was um, not super comfortable with me asking people where they live or what institution they're at, um, that it might sort of break confidentiality. It's sort of on me that I didn't push harder to get this. So I don't really have as enough data um, kind of on like where people were working um, at a very like micro level. Mm -hmm. um, I can say a lot of people sort of self-reported, you know, being in, in cities, Kind of in free text responses in cities that they didn't feel comfortable being out in their local setting which you know is is a question i often get about people who, you know applying to grad school uh do i need to take into account like the local climate about where i apply to grad school and you know, yeah absolutely it's a constant consideration particularly in the us like do i limit my search even for faculty jobs for places that i i'm gonna feel comfortable living as a queer person outside of the university. Yeah, that's yeah. a really good point. Um, then we got uh, Jose Vigna, who is uh, also part of our uh, GSD working group. Um, they asked, do you find LGBTQIA people suffer imposter syndrome more often? So feeling inadequate, stressed, depressed by conducting professional work. Yeah, yeah. I think that's definitely sort of Listed and something that I'm hoping to kind of follow up on a little bit more um, directly asking about imposter syndrome. Um, yeah, so I think it's sort of implicit in the responses, but I didn't have an exact item worded around imposter syndrome. Uh, yeah, people definitely report feeling kind of like undervalued or that their work is not taken as, as seriously. Um, and sort of relatedly, this is something that comes up a lot is that people that are actively studying kind of queer topics are often told that their work is, I don't know, too niche or not as important. Um, I will say even in trying to get this paper published, a lot of sort of psychology and neuroscience journals told me that, that like, it's not a broad enough, you know, a topic with not enough broad appeal, it's too niche and it should go to like a sexuality journal specifically. Um, so I think that kind of interfaces with the imposter syndrome question. Yeah, like, absolutely. Constantly being told that your work is not relevant. Yeah. 
Yeah, I've actually I work together here with someone who who's running into the same issues of trying to publish similar data and being told like diversity efforts are not good enough to go in these in these journals. Yeah. Um, Matilda, who's who's great support from the Alba office, um, asked um, a question about LGBT scientists being told that they should not talk about their personal lives. Uh, there is also specifically for older generations a desire to not talk about about it. The usual, it's no one's business. And Alba has sometimes found it difficult for scientists to talk openly about that. Do you think that this is just the internalization of the fact that talking about your personal life as a queer person is taboo? What could we stop this vicious cycle of fear of talking about it? Yeah, that's a really difficult question. Um, yes, I, I do think there's still this kind of implication that your identity, that like science is this kind of pure thing and your personal identity should not influence it. Like the data is the data. Um, which is a really kind of troubling perspective. Like we are all human and we need to understand our biases and how our experiences inform how we do science. And it's really the privilege of white cisgender straight men to say that your identity doesn't matter. <laughs> um, yes, and so, I don't know. I mean, I think I have a lot of privilege and a lot of support in my work. And so I try to be very vocal about my identity to model that for other other, um, for other people. And I'm hoping just as things kind of progress, people will feel more comfortable making that choice for themselves, mm -hmm. but yeah. Yeah, I mean, it is, it is, you know, heartening to see that uptick, the graph you showed going through the generations that yeah. you know in in the in the Gen Z population, uh, a much larger proportion is feeling um, comfortable in coming out and and you know, um, hopefully also talking more openly about their sexuality. Um, and I mean that's something that we. I mean I study teenagers for the most part, and so really mm -hmm. like being on top of those trends is incredibly critical for the work that we do and making sure that we're kind of it and sort of aligned with your efforts for conferences, like making sure that we're asking the right questions for younger generations to identify with, to make sure that we're representing their identities and experiences in our psychological research. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so we've got a question here from an anonymous, anonymous attendee. I'd like to know about best policies with mentioning our pronouns. I've heard mm. different opinions about it, like it might make people that are not out uncomfortable. At the same time, it is important to know pronouns when people are out so we don't make mistakes. Um, is there any data on this? I'm not aware of any systematic data on this. Um, I mean, personally, I think can't really force people to go either way, but kind of uh, where you are comfortable, make that available. I will say, I just noticed that like, I'm not signed into my Zoom account and so it didn't default to putting my pronouns here. Um, yeah, but I think kind of listening to people and their experiences, if people do feel uncomfortable, that should be kind of, we should be aware of that and, and find a way to, to handle it. Um, but I haven't really seen any systematic evidence that it's like causing harm, certainly. Yeah, exactly. I believe having uh, not displaying pronouns may also mean that you you just like don't care about pronouns. So you have the, there is also a, a positive word. There is nothing like it's not always hiding their pronouns or feeling uncomfortable. Sometimes it's also uh, actual active <laughs> not displaying. So yeah, I mean I think. I mean, hopefully, you know, putting it in your email signature is at least like a signal to the people that you're talking to that you've actively thought about this, if nothing else. Yeah, exactly. And I think for for me coming from like, obviously, I have my pronouns on screen, my pronouns are they, them, um, which is, maybe, you know, less usual for a lot of people. But I have, you know, gone through this period where I was exploring my pronouns and wasn't really sure what to tell people. And, and even still, I'm still exploring like do, using different ones. Um, but I think definitely having the, definitely like forcing people to do it 
is the wrong choice probably but you know making it an option at least um for example like having the option on you know going back to our work with the gfd um having it an option on like conference badges would be great um but again like not forcing anyone to to put put anything in and if people don't display their pronouns i think it's always best practice to you know refer to them um in a neutral way unless they they uh, tell you other ways um and then matilda had another question uh what would be the next step after this paper could we use the survey um in other countries which you already mentioned as well yeah 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 uh i mean personally i'm hoping to kind of do a follow-up that is a little more broad so soliciting responses kind of on experiences not just of queer people but being able to kind of compare experiences and, and disparities between queer people and, and straight identified people in these fields, um, which kind of takes a different like distribution tactic to reach a broader audiences. Um, so my plan is kind of refine, shorten the questionnaire a little bit and then try to hit, hit a broader audience to see where particular points of disparities might be and things that we can do better. I'm definitely open to sharing this more Broadly, if people are interested in kind of collaborating and, and bringing that to other countries as well. Um, I think I personally I have the best sense of kind of the academic universe in, in the US and how these dynamics work. But, you know, it's something that we just need to address much more broadly because the data is not there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Jordan uh, said that he just wanted to mention, obviously, this is this is very US central, but um, uh, we just had a decision here from the Supreme Court about affirmative action. Um, yeah. So basically, very shortly for for the non-US folk, what this means is essentially Supreme Court just ruled that universities cannot use. I think this is specifically for race-based um, yeah. admissions for university. They cannot like uh, uh, use essentially positive discrimination. So so increasing the number of of people of color, for example. Um, can you maybe touch up on this? Like, what does this mean in terms of like queer people as well? Um, do you have any ideas on this? Yeah, I mean, it's a very new decision, so we will see. I have a feeling it's not going to affect queer people as much because it's our identities are not often counted among diversity efforts. So this is something that we've grappled with a lot. You know, John Freeman particularly, like with our funding agencies, government funding agencies, so NIH and NSF. Uh, queer identity is not considered sort of a diversity point. So none of this really <laughs> affects us. I think it's the kind of thing that you can always hopefully like write it into your personal statement when applying to university. And then they kind of grapple with how to handle, you know, weighing that decision. Um, and it's, it's a complicated challenge. I, we've definitely talked about this as well in terms of like hiring um, so finding ways, say, for universities to increase efforts to hire queer faculty when questions about orientation and gender expression are kind of prohibit, like HR here won't let you ask about those or force people to disclose about them. So how do you kind of hire people while also protecting um, those identities? It, it's a tricky line to walk, um, you know, and, and Again, like the, the NSF didn't want to add questions about um, sexual orientation and gender identity to their very broad surveys um, of like graduate students and postdocs in, in the US. And so again, sort of for me, it's like, if they're not gonna do it, we have to. And if we can kind of show in smaller data sets that there are these disparities, it may help bolster efforts to kind of make this more systemic. Yeah. The data. Um, and I think we're we're largely out of questions and we're almost out of time. I just wanted to ask one one final question. Um, so you talked in your paper, you get this really nice overview of things that you know we can do to improve um, to improve this situation. Um, do you have any sort of advice specific advice for 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 example queer people who are out and in a comfortable position or for allies what are things that we can really push for yeah i mean we've again been grappling this with 
uh, about this at Columbia as well. And I think we kind of instituted a new affinity group. Um, and I will always say like a little goes a long way, like having that space where queer people can come together and just like know that they're not the only one in their department is a huge, huge first step. It doesn't require any money or like any institutional buy-in just saying like this group exists has been a huge win for us. Mm -hmm. um, and then also I, I think it's important to like have the people in your community tell you what they want. So rather than having the institution kind of top down decide what initiatives should be put in place to help queer people, like asking people in the university or other academic setting, like, what do they want? How do they want to feel supported? And then working kind of from the ground up. Um, so at least in my experience, kind of creating that network, making people feel seen and heard, and then giving them an opportunity to get feedback on, on what they want really goes a long, a long way um, and making sure that we're addressing the right kind of policy changes that, that people need. Yeah, that sounds like, like, a really good, a good ending. I want to thank you again for this great talk. Um, I'll put the link to the paper in the chat again. It's really a great paper, so I encourage everyone to read it. Um, thank you all for attending. I think Jordan wanted to say a few last words. No, thank you both for this fantastic webinar. Thanks, David, for presenting this, and thanks, Lori, for handling and and uh, all all of these. Uh, panel with uh, incredible questions from uh, the audience, uh, constructive. Uh, just one last word, remember that joining ALBA is totally free, so use the link in the chat now to join ALBA. You can be involved in many activities, including the LGBTQIA plus support, but also other activities that ALBA organizes go and sign the declaration after you read it and your value and the fact that you're here today i think speaks to your willingness to uh, stay with us and to advocate with us for a better inclusion diversity and justice for an equal and equity around the world and thanks everyone and thanks the alba office again for giving us this platform you have a good day or evening depending on where you're joining and yes i do believe there is um record of this session for the participants will probably receive a link where they can uh, watch again thank you very much everyone <laughs>